Hey, hello, hi. You are listening to the Equitheory Podcast, and I am your host, Jill Treese. And for this week's episode, we are going to be answering some patron questions. Um, so if you don't know, you can become a patron of the podcast or of me <laughs> and the horses. And there's an ad on here that tells you more information about that. But essentially, depending on your tier, you can ask me one or as many questions as you would like. Um, I do want to quickly add that there are two people that want to do calls. Um, so we we might be having bonus episodes here and there because I don't want to make them wait <laughs> for me to get to the next week and I have a lot of episodes already pre-planned at this point so um, that might be a thing that's happening I'm going to reach out to them and uh, discuss it and see if we can't make that happen so there might be bonus episodes where I talk to some of you guys and answer your questions on the podcast and uh, you know the listeners will get to hear that conversation so you can hear how I kind of work through the issues and the information that I think is relevant you know maybe I don't, I don't know. Um, but some of the topics we're going to talk about today are ulcers, separation, and food anxiety, intelligent disobedience, lesson anxiety in the horse, actually, uh, aggression, a lazy horse, blanket biting, and perspectives on riding after switching to positive reinforcement. So it wouldn't be a podcast without a burp. I was really trying to keep that one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, just so unprofessional. Anyway, uh, let's just roll the music. where you can support me and the horses directly. If you're willing and able, check us out at Jet Real Podcast on your patron app or at patreon.com slash Jet Real Podcast. When you become a patron of the podcast, you can ask me questions that I'll answer on the podcast, receive merch, and have access to live Q&A events, which means you get your questions answered in real time. Uh, at the higher tiers, you have the option for phone call consults with me on air or privately, as well as access to online training with me, depending on your tier. Ooh, fun. Uh, lastly, should you decide to become a patron, just know you can cancel at any time and subscribe and unsubscribe as you please. And if you can't support us through Patreon, absolutely no worries at all. Listening alone is more than enough. And I just want to say thank you to all the current and future patrons, me and the ponies, appreciate it endlessly. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to get into the part where I talk about things you're interested in. Okay, here we go. I think my cats have perhaps, nope, one is in the litter box now. They do this awesome thing where when I feed them, they immediately go to the litter box and relieve themselves. And that smells horrible because I'm in a very small house. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, cat poop aside, we've got a lot of questions to answer today and I'm going to try and rock and roll through these. I did actually, everyone, to your shock. <laughs> um, I did actually go through the questions and try and condense them a little bit um, because you guys are my people and therefore long-winded. <laughs> but I get it also. I mean, there has to be some background uh, in order to fully answer a question about training and behavior and things like that. So um, I feel like it's worth reading it because obviously I've read the question. I could just say, so in a horse it has ulcers, but I think it, I think it helps more to have that context. So hopefully you guys understand my logic there. But yeah, let's just jump into these questions. So the first one is from patron Alyssa, and it's about ulcers. So um, her question says, I have this horse that I've been working with a couple times a week, mostly just light riding to give her some exercise. So she's not standing in a stall all the time. And she's very head shy. If you move too fast, she flinches away violently. Sadly, she is smacked in the face and shoulder a lot. She has an older lady, maybe late 70s, that owns her. So she's kind of set in her ways, the lady I'm assuming <laughs> anyway I already know she has ulcers and have told the owner but I don't think she's done anything about it or going to so I try to make sure she has as much hay as possible although I know it won't fix I hope it helps some she's very girthy so I don't use a saddle and if you touch her side she swishes her tail and pins her ears sorry my cats are sprinting in the background <laughs> Um, she is a 19 year old retired Western pleasure horse. So if you, um, so she has that very slow, lazy type of walk, try and canter. So I'm mostly just working on getting her to extend her legs and move more naturally. Thankfully, all you have to do is cluck, cluck, and she will move out. So no kicking. A few of the kids at the barn have been riding her and all they used on her were spurs and big ported bitch, which she doesn't need. Sorry. Stuff like that always trips me up when it's like, bitch, witch, <laughs> bitch, witch. So bitch. Yep. <laughs> Sorry for swearing. Didn't mean to. <laughs> Big ported bits, which she doesn't need. They would smack her anytime she was a little grumpy acting, which is her showing she's hurting from the ulcers. 
She's also very shut down, and she has unfortunately learned that she doesn't get listened to, so she puts up with almost anything. But I'm hoping that soon she will start coming out of it and being a little more goofy and playful. So basically what I'm asking is, how can I help her with her head shyness? I don't want her to be afraid of me or spook when I try to move uh, slowly and give her lots of treats when I'm with her and put her out in the field with my boys so she can get as much grass as possible. I only ride her bareback so we don't have to worry about the saddle hurting her or the girth, and I only ride her in a halter so she doesn't have to worry about being slammed in the mouth with a big bit. I'm working on teaching her the rules of clicker training so she doesn't have to search for food and be smacked in the face. I'm also going to help her understand what I am doing along with anyone else that handles her oh help her owner sorry the lady um so she won't get mixed signals and get hurt so that is a question i'm going to proceed to my thoughts um so yeah it's great that you are being so considerate a lot of what you've already done is like a plus plus um so the head shyness that is a tricky one because um in my experience and in my like i guess philosophy ideology in order to truly overcome head shyness you have to be very careful to never give the horse a reason to fear um you know them getting smacked in the face (laughs) really um with anything um be it a whip a hand the bridle any other thing a bucket you could hit a horse with um so um and and that's tricky because if she is acting quote unquote aggressively towards other people and her owner and they have decided the solution is to reprimand her corporally then um you know it's probably not going to do a whole lot of good for her associations with other people it might really help with you but i would assume or um venture to reason that she's probably just gonna be head shy Um, So the goal would be to, um, you know, remove the reason people have to um, hurt her. So I would start all the way from the back. So the reason people hit her is because, okay, so the reason she's head shy is because people hit her. And the reason they hit her is because she maybe tries to bite at them or pins her ears or looks grumpy or aggressive. And the people don't like that. So you know, if you can't fix the people, the other alternate solution is to fix the reason, you know, so you might not be able to fix the people punishing that behavior, but maybe if you could fix the, um, the (laughs) reason, my cats are distracting me so bad, um, if you could fix the reason that she's biting or that she has to be aggressive, i.e. the ulcers, then you could just completely dodge the situation altogether and then maybe on the flip side you know after the ulcers are fixed then (laughs) you could be like hey look um you don't have to hit her anymore because she's not being aggressive because it was the ulcers not your punishment working um and you know obviously you wouldn't probably have to say that directly but it would um it would probably just be obvious that's some of our positive reinforcement, um, show, not tell (laughs) kind of tricky philosophy there. That's just like, okay, if you won't listen, then let's, let's demonstrate it. Um, so now you have this other problem of the owner doesn't really want to, um, treat her for ulcers. So, um, that is a really tricky situation. So I have dealt with this in the past and it is really difficult when people, think their horses are fine um, because what you have to understand is that this lady has her horse and she loves her horse presumably and she (laughs) rides her and takes care of her and thinks she knows her horse the best and that's fine and we're all entitled to that and of course we love that and that's why we deal with horses is because we feel connected and we love them but (laughs) if you suggest that the reason she is acting the way she's acting is because of ulcers and this lady has not you know um made that connection for herself and to recognize that the horse might have ulcers would mean that um you know the smacking and the punishment was unnecessary and she was actually punishing an animal that was in pain the whole time so you have to think about that's really hard for some people to deal with. Now, that doesn't justify, um, you know, continuing to just smack horses who are in pain, um, you know, for the sake of your own ego. But for context's sake and, um, you know, keeping a compassionate perspective. Oh, sorry. Burp again. Um, I think it is really important to keep that, um, you know, in your peripheral that 
the reason that you might not be seeing that change is because it's a really hard thing to confront. You know, I mean, you think you're doing the best you can and you've been taught all these things and you know so much and you love your animal and you think you're doing it a service by disciplining it. Um, but really you've just been, you know, harming an animal that's been in pain, reprimanding them for telling you, Hey, that hurts. It's not an easy thing to confront um, mentally. So it's easier to just be like, no, she doesn't have ulcers. She's fine. You're being dramatic. You know, she just needs discipline. Um, so keep that in mind. But also, I, I love what you're doing, um, you know, trying to give her hay and keep her out with buddies and stuff. That's all very good um, prevention and, you know, maintenance things. But I don't know that it's going to really help get rid of them unless the other things that are causing the ulcers change. So typically horses get them um, for many reasons. And I plan on doing a deep dive on this later, so I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I want to have a chance to take a look at some more studies and do a lot of research on it. Um, But from what I know at the moment is ulcers usually come from high stress or really high sugar diets. If you guys are struggling with a horse that's showing some of these symptoms or, um, you know, just isn't acting quite right and is maybe really girthy or grumpy or um, when you go to touch them, they flinch. I would really suggest taking a look at DePaolo Equine Concepts. Um, They have um, a bunch of videos and a blog all about digestive health. If you go to YouTube and type in how to palpate a horse for ulcers, you can find the video where they show you how to do that. And it's very easy to do. But if you do it, please don't get kicked or bitten. (laughs) And it's a pretty good way to tell. Um, Obviously, it's, I don't know how well it tests for hindgut ulcers, but it can give you an idea and it's a lot cheaper than scoping, which you have to like, you know, take the horse off grain for a while and then, um, you know, for like a day prior so they can scope it. And it's like this whole big long process. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't get a vet out, but, um, you know, speaking as somebody who knows how expensive horses are, um, sometimes you can just go ahead and treat and um, double check with your veterinarian that it's not going to harm your horse to treat. But generally speaking, you're not going to hurt them. Um, I would fact check that and be sure. But if I were um, Alyssa in the situation, patron Alyssa, I would say to have a conversation with um, with this lady and say, okay, look, you know, I've been working with this mare for a while and I absolutely adore her. She is just one of my favorite personalities I've ever worked with. I think she is incredible and she has, you know, all this life to give. But I think that something that I'm doing is not working. So see, I I wonder if we can work together to try and, um, you know, find a solution here and be like, okay, so since I have been working with her and she has bitten and been sensitive in her skin and, um, you know, just seems really reactive and girthy and angry. Um, I, I've been punishing her, you know, like we've discussed, but it, it doesn't seem to be working. So it got me thinking and researching and she is showing all of the symptoms of a horse with ulcers. And, um, you know, we couldn't have known before, but I'm, I'm thinking that we should really just go ahead and treat her. I've done the research and I have palpated her. I can show you the video. Um, I'll send you the link and I can show you how I've palpated her. Um, and, you know, if you don't have time right now, I can just take a video of it and send it to you. Um, so you can look over it and think it over. You don't have to make a decision right now. There's no pressure, but I just, I really think that we could go ahead and treat her if you aren't comfortable and you, you know, aren't really on board with it. Um, I could pay for it. Um, I could just buy, I think usually it's like a couple tubes of ulcer guard or, um, gastro guard. Hey, let's not choke the kitten. Wally. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> My big cat is, like, sitting on top of the small one. Um, hey. There we go. Throw the leaf bottle. <laughs> um, anyway, so I think it's just a couple of tubes, honestly. And, um, you know, you could just say, I, I would be more than happy to go ahead and pay for them and take care of it all together if it's not something you're really interested in. I just really would like to see if we can get a change in her attitude um, because it really hurts me to have to hit her. And I know you don't like it either. And 
if it, if it is something else, great. Then we don't have to hit her anymore. And, you know, maybe you could go into that a little bit. Maybe not. Depends. You, you know her better than I do. So you could, um, you know, be a better gauge of that. Um, hey, everyone. Be nice. <laughs> but, um, you know, just to have an honest conversation and be collaborative and make her a part of it instead of attacking and being like, your horse has ulcers and you're beating her unnecessarily. <laughs> Probably not going to go very well. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I would definitely say she's showing some signs of ulcers. It's very, very, very common. And um, the next steps are to take a look at her grain. If she has a lot of sugar in her diet, um, that needs to be addressed because the ulcers will come right back. Um, and I would just, I would seriously do some research on uh, looking into your feed and that sort of thing. And a way that I approached it um, with my boss when I was trying to switch to a... Um, lower sugar feed was, you know, I told her everything and she has had a lot of experiences, you know, with her personal horse, um, who has sadly passed on, not due to a stomach issue, but, um, he got his foot stuck in a stall door and it caused problems that he just couldn't really recover from. But he used to colic all the time and she could not figure out why. Now knowing what we know, we we have some ideas about why, but, um, you know, she couldn't have known and you can only do what you can with what you know at the time. So, um, now that we know better, we do better. (laughs) But back then she, um, had switched to a feed and she'd seen a really significant decrease in colicking after this horse. And, um, I wanted to switch to a low sugar feed because of their feet and, um, because of, you know, ulcers and personality, um, type things and having a lot of sugar, really like you're almost guaranteed to get ulcers because horses bodies aren't uh, made to process high amounts of uh, sugar so when I suggested that we switch to a lower sugar food she was really really not open to it because she was like look Jill I've had horses colic on me and die and I have finally found a feed that seems to be agreeing with them better and I do not want to change and she was like I'm not risking my horses no and I was like shit. (laughs) Um, and it was definitely a night that, um, you know, was a little more sensitive than most. (laughs) Um, and I'm not dogging her at all. She knows. Um, but you know, we talked about it some more and, um, I was like, look, I, I know that you, you know what you're doing and you know what we're talking about, but the research shows about ulcers, which cause colic and also the difference in their feed. And if we can, adjust their feed to where they don't have to get their feet done so often, um, which obviously part of me is like, "Mm, no, (laughs) but, um, if, you know, if you're having big cracks and a lot of thrush, they're going to need a lot more attention than if their feet are just good and they have to be done every, you know, four to six weeks. Um, so that's what I meant by that. And I was like, we can reduce our bill there. And, um, you know, you have to, you don't have to feed as much, blah, blah, blah. And like, I just, I presented it in a way that made sense from a financial perspective, as well as a, um, welfare and health perspective. And finally she was like, okay, let's give it a shot. I'm going to stick with this brand. Um, it has, a, I think our feed right now, Um, it's blue bonnet feed. It's got a 3% sugar in it, I think. Um, but the horses, the change we've seen in them has been absolutely incredible. Um, so we made a compromise. I wanted a feed that had no sugar in it, but she was like, I want to stay within this brand because it's a really good brand. And I was like, okay, so that's good enough. Let's try it and let's see what happens. And the horses have completely completely changed. And I am so excited (laughs) about that. So, I mean, you know, sometimes you might have to compromise. It might not be exactly what you want, but you can get somewhere and some help. Um, and in our case, it, the compromise actually ended up doing what we wanted it to anyway. Um, so long story short, I would say that, um, you know, I would do some more research and be sure that you could just treat with ulcer guard and, you know, not see any, Um, problems, but I would also try to figure out why she has ulcers, be it, is her life too stressful? I mean, people that are constantly punching her in the face, um, and, you know, using big spurs and ported bits, that might be stressful enough that, um, uh, it's causing her stomach to act up or she is on, cause I mean, what you said, she's 
a Western pleasure horse, I'm assuming. It's either a thoroughbred or a quarter horse. Um, and typically what I've seen, and I could be you know, totally wrong, but judging from my area, which is predominantly Western, um, and quarter horses tend to be such easy keepers that people just feed them the cheapest, <laughs> uh, you know, tractor supply, farmer's brand, sweet feed, and that is detrimental to stomachs, even to an iron stomach like a quarter horse, still not great. So, um, yeah, just maybe think about some things like that. Take a look at her feed and see if you can't um, maybe find a, another feed to suggest that is perhaps cheaper or, um, you know, equal price around there, not much more. And just be like, I really think that we could try this. And if you're not open to it, um, maybe I could pay for it for a few months and see if we see a change. And then if you like it, you know, you can we can renegotiate then. Um but yeah, I mean, obviously don't bite off more than you can chew. And if you can't afford it, that's that's another thing too. Um, but I don't know. I hope those suggestions help, um, you know, because I, I know the question was mostly about head shyness, but I really feel like that problem is not going to go away unless the biting behavior goes away. And the the way to treat the biting behavior is not to punish it. It's to stop giving her a reason to bite and two reasons that a horse would bite would be because it perceives you as a threat or because it's trying to communicate that hurts um and all of her grumpy acting tail swishing biting ear pinning and not wanting to extend and reach out in her gates is all very indicative of uh pain so i would say um, you know, you can address the head shyness in pretty much the way that you would, um, you would think systematic, um, you know, desensitization through successive approximation. So essentially you just, you know, start with your hand out away from her. And then if she looks at it, puts an ear on it, moves towards it, click, and then gradually start, um, you know, encouraging her through your, um, marking to put her head in your hand, give her the control. So Mac, we had, um, he was my retired racehorse project, um, that <laughs> didn't end up being my retired racehorse project. Um, but he was really head shy when we got him. And, um, instead of me clicking for him, tolerating me touching him or being near him, I clicked him for coming near me. So if I held my hand up, then, um, he knew how to t cheek target on both sides and, um, you know, put his head in my hand. Um, so I didn't have to ever, you know, come up and touch him. I wasn't invading his space. So, you know, with a horse who is head shy, um, you coming at them, even if you've clicked and reinforced it and tried to counter condition it, you know, there might always be some level of discomfort, but if you give them the power, it's a completely different cue. So instead of saying, I'm coming into your space, you better hope I'm not going to hit you. Um, and ins instead you say, here's my hand. I'm, it's not coming to you, you know, I mean, obviously it has to be somewhat moved and presented near, but just holding your hand out and saying, okay, it's not coming at you. I want you to come to it. I'm giving you the choice and you the control. And that completely changes the dynamic and, um, you know, the circumstance. So the horse's reaction is different. And then, um, you know, after you've worked on that, you can show the people that ride her and be like, okay, so you know how, you know, she's really head shy. Uh, I have taught her how to put her head in your hand. So instead of scaring her because she's been used to being hit, if, um, you know, you come at her, she might anticipate that and still be a little shy. And she feels a lot more comfortable if you just present your hand and then she comes to you. Um, and then you can give her scratches and tell her how good she is and all of that good stuff. Um, so maybe something like that. Um, also, the last thing I have to say is I though I know what you're trying to do riding bareback, um, she could still be sensitive, um, from the ulcers that, um, riding bareback and having that concentrated pressure, um, might also not feel fantastic. Um, cause if you think about it, when you're in a saddle, you've got all your weight distributed out over the tree of the saddle. That's what they're designed to do. Um, so, um, if you don't know what a saddle tree is like inside, um, where you sit, there is this, um, 
<laughs> it, it looks like the seat of a saddle inside the saddle and it goes on either side of the horse's spine and then it's connected over the top but so it doesn't touch the withers hopefully um but in a well-fitted saddle what that does is it sits evenly across the horse's back and when you sit on it it distributes your weight out over the whole back so you're not concentrated in one area and that's why it's so important to have a well-fitted saddle because if it doesn't fit you're doing the same thing you know concentrating all your weight in one area and bareback is great and fun and I absolutely love it but it is it it can be uncomfortable for the horse especially in one that's having some sensitivity issues due to ulcers but yeah I hope that that somewhat helps um I I hope that you can get her owner to understand and you know like I said approach it with compassion and sincerity and just be like look I really care about this horse and I understand that you do too and you are doing the best you can but um, you know, I've looked into this and researched it a lot, and this is what I think, um, we could really do to try and alleviate that behavior that we both don't like, because I also know that neither of us enjoy hitting her and punishing her. So if we could get that to go away another way, um, I think it's worth a shot. And, you know, if you're not down or you don't want to, you know, do all the work, I'm more than happy to take care of it for you and then show you what I've done on the backside. You know, um, I don't know. I hope that helps. So, Rocking and rolling along. Number two from an anonymous patron says, um, I don't know where to start properly without overwhelming or going too fast. My mare is attached to her herd and I work with her in her paddock with the horses next door because if I let them out into the next field, she goes crazy. She's been in a herd since birth and never seems fully focused on me as she's always watching the herd to make sure that they don't leave her. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but there could also be some food anxiety. Before I bought her, she was left out all the time to fight for food and was always last to eat. Now she knows she'll always be fed, but by giving treats, she is moving backward um, to have her head by my hand. This makes it hard for me to teach her how to lift her feet when she's moving backward, and I've tried putting the food into a bowl as to not make uh, my hand the feed giver, but she didn't understand that there was food in it and then didn't seem as excited to work. Okay, so clearly within this question, there is a lot to unpack. Sounds like we've got separation anxiety. We have um, some inattention during training, food anxiety, and um, backing up to get food. So let's get into it. So being attached with her herd and um, seems like she's worried about the horses leaving her. It's, it's hard for me to say. Um, it definitely could be that it also could be something else and, um, maybe, you know, it, with horses that are really distracted during training, it, it definitely could be because they're worried about their herd. But if you're, um, if you have her in the paddock next to them, um, I, I don't, I don't know that I, I mean, it, it definitely could be, but I am cautious to say that that could be the only explanation so maybe a potential solution to that is when you put her out in the next field um, or put her, you said, I work with her in the paddock with the horses next door. So I'm assuming you're in like an adjacent paddock. Um, so what I would do is let her into that paddock and um, maybe put out some hay and just let her hang out and just kind of watch and see what she does. If she is running the fence line and pacing, then I would say she's probably definitely <laughs> very uncomfortable. Um, and maybe we don't need to start um, in there. But if she's just munching on the hay, kind of looking around, um, you know, you, you're probably all right. Um, and it could just be that um, what happens with a lot of beginning, um, you know, positive reinforcement trainers is that it's really hard to keep your reinforcement rate high enough because in the traditional training world, we come from this perspective that, you know, you've got to get the behavior, ask for more, ask for more, ask for more. So think about it when you're riding and you are going around the arena and the horse does the trot transition you want. Um, you don't come down to a walk and, you know, let them relax. You know, you normally keep going and then eventually you move into extended trot or lateral work and then um, you shorten and lengthen and then maybe you ask for canter all before you walk. So we're used to getting a lot of things done really quickly and um, positive reinforcement um, at the beginning doesn't lend itself to doing that. You can absolutely get there where you can chain and do a lot of things for a long time without, um, you know, 
feeding. There's still reinforcement in there because of secondary reinforcing and, um, you know, things like that, but I won't get into that. But, um, you know, you have to do it well. And it sounds like a lot. (laughs) And I'm not trying to scare you guys away, but it is a different way of thinking. And um, so when you go into work with a horse, when you've started training with positive reinforcement, you have to be sure that you are not raising your criteria too quickly. So if you're asking her to pick up her foot, you know, maybe you start with just Uh, clicking for a weight shift. So she's shifting her weight off the foot you want her to pick up. Um, And then you move to, um, you know, maybe she lifts it slightly. And then you gradually increase to the height you want it and then holding it for longer periods of time. You have to work up to all of that. Even if the horse knows how to pick up their feet, you know, when you're training with positive reinforcement, um, it still might be a process obviously it'll go faster if they already know how to pick up their feet through negative reinforcement but you also have to be careful um you know that the reason they're doing it is not for the negative reinforcement otherwise it's just negative reinforcement with a cherry on top but anyway more semantics um so what i would do as far as the um separation anxiety is just you know see what she's doing in the field and just observe her and if she is pretty chill and you know i mean she might be aware and con- or casually looking over at the horses in the next field uh, or in the next I don't know, because you said, I work with her in a paddock with the horses next door, because if I let them into the field, she goes crazy. So I'm assuming you're still in separate paddocks. I, I'm i confused. But um, anyway, theoretically, put her in the other paddock, give her some hay so she, you know, doesn't just have nothing in there, um, and then just hang out. Stand by her and see what she does. If she's looking at the other horses constantly or running around, um, you know, that's probably a good indication that she's very uncomfortable, and um, you might have to um, you know, take some more steps to break it down further, but I would venture to say it's probably, um, the lack of focus usually indicates, um, that your training is not, um, you know, being reinforcing enough. Um, but again, in cases of separation anxiety, sometimes you have to work up to moving away from the herd and, uh, make it a really good thing to be away from them and with you, um, by creating positive associations and successively moving further and further away, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in this case, I would say that you just need to make it really reinforcing to be, um, working with you And, you know, she's allowed to pay attention to the herd and, you know, think about them. But um, there's also the possibility for displacement behaviors and that sort of thing. Um, So I would just really make sure that when you go into a training session, you know what you're doing. Um, And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, maybe 10 minutes before you go into your session, just take a moment, sit down and think about what you want to do. And if your goal behavior is to pick up her foot, break it down into the smallest possible piece, which is, does she let you touch her leg? Is she comfortable with you standing next to her? Is she comfortable with you running your hand down her leg? You know, all of the things that, you know, people usually do to um, train that. So like with the babies, I did not train them to pick up their feet by squeezing on their tendon, you know, like normal. And um, so I just run my hand down their leg and they pick their feet up. And I taught them that because I clicked at the slightest indication that they were going to pick their foot up. So I train all of our baby horses predominantly with scratches. So when I, um, when I was working on picking up their feet, I would run my hand down their leg and they would kind of like turn around and look at me, you know, and in the process of, you know, sniffing my butt (laughs) or my leg or seeing what I was doing down there, they might shift their weight over to the other leg. So then I click and then I give them scratches and they're like, wait a minute. And then gradually I work on isolating, um, that weight shift. So they might do that before they turn around and look. Um, and then I weed out the turning around and looking behavior also. And, um, some of them, they would, um, take a step back to see what I was doing instead. So when they shifted their weight and lifted their foot, I would click. And then I gradually started isolating for just pick up this foot, don't move backward. And that's, that's how I trained all of them with all four feet. Um, so there are different ways to go about it, but, um, you have to be, really paying attention that if you aren't reinforcing often enough, they're going to be like, this isn't worth it. I'd rather do something else. Um, so be sure that you're not making it too hard. Um, 
and also not too easy because if it's too easy they might not be interested um, also make sure that it's a treat she really likes and maybe when um, maybe you keep an extra treat like for Zoe she likes alfalfa pellets but she really likes carrots so I keep some carrots on me when I'm working with her so that if she does something really exceptional I can reward her with that um, and that kind of diversifies what she's eating as well as you know keeps her really motivated so um, there's that um, also food anxiety. Um, now she knows she'll always be fed and a horse that has food anxiety. It, it you, there, there's no way to ever really know that she'll always be fed, you know? Um, so just because she's now in a, a home where she will always be fed doesn't necessarily mean that her anxiety is totally gone about it. Um, and that is something to consider that, um, you know, she might still be a little uncomfortable, but as far as that being, um, you know, your conclusion because she's moving backwards to come to the treat. Um, that's possible. And that might be the reason why that behavior started, but also you might be reinforcing it. So what I would do is I would take a step back and not literally like take a step back in training and start by, um, doing the rules of the game or, uh, manners training. So you stand next to them and you may have to start outside of the fence if you haven't done this already. If you have, it's a good refresher. So, um, you know, stand next to them, um, shoulder to shoulder or in front of them or wherever you are comfortable standing. And, um, then when they stand with their head in front of their chest square and out of your space. So, Again, to clarify, because I'm kind of all over the place. If you're standing shoulder to shoulder with your horse and you have treats, you don't want them in your space because that is where we get horses that um, are quote unquote pushy or muggy or rude. Um, so they're naturally foragers. So they're going to do that naturally unless you give them an alternative behavior to perform. That's what they're going to do because they don't know how to do anything else. So if you have... If you're standing shoulder to shoulder with your horse and they take their head out of your space, click. And the most important part here is when you click, especially with a horse that knows that the click means a treat is coming, um, do not feed them back in your space because you're completely undoing what you're working on. So if your horse moves their head out of their space and you click, you get the treat and then you take your hand out of your space and feed them where you clicked them for being. So... If they move to where their head is completely centered in their chest and their neck is straight, you feed them there also. Um, and that way the horse learns that they never have to come to you for food, that you bring it to them. And that's the rule. You want them to stand still and that you bring them food. And you can work on this in so many other places. So if you're standing next to them and you click for that, um, then, you know, in the beginning you might have to be really quick about it. So if they... Um, if you click, you might have to like, don't scare them obviously, but bring your hand rather quickly up to them before they have a chance to move, make them successful. Don't wait 10 minutes and they're like moving all over the place. Um, so, and then you can build up to where you step away from them. I did this with Zoe with, um, mat training. So maybe that's another thing that you want to work on. Um, you set a mat out and have them put their feet on it. And then, um, you gradually increase your distance from them and click them for standing. And then you come and bring them the food. Um, and that'll help a lot with the hoof training because that way you aren't trying to work on her picking up her foot and, um, not coming to you for the treat. But really, it's all about being diligent with your click and um, your feeding etiquette. If you are feeding the horse near you and rewarding them also for coming to you, then they don't have any reason to do something else. Um, so I would really recommend that you start without working on the feet first um, and really get it solid that she knows that you're going to bring her the food and she doesn't have to come to you for it. Um, and then, yeah, just be really diligent about where you feed her. Even if you're working on a new behavior, keep that consistent. You only want to change one thing at a time. So get that really solid before you start working on the uh, picking up feet again. Um, as far as trying to work on putting it in a bowl instead of your hand being the feed giver, um, 
and her, you said she didn't understand that there was food in it and then didn't seem as excited to work. Um, so yeah, I've heard a lot of things about horses. Um, it's more exciting to be hand fed for some reason. I think a lot of people have come to that conclusion. Um, but you also have to teach the horse about the bucket. So just like you taught them that the clicker means that, um, they've done the right thing and that food is coming. You also have to teach them, um, you know, that food can come in the form of being in the bucket. Um, it's just like anything else. You can't just expect the horse to understand it. You can't explain it to them with words. So you have to explain it to them with reinforcement and being systematic in your training. So, um, you know, maybe you do something simple that the horse is really good at. Um, so maybe you started with targeting and, um, so you ask the horse to maybe target, um, I don't know, your hand or a cone or a Gatorade bottle or your target stick, whatever you have, target it, you know, close to the ground near the bucket. And then, um, you know, when she touches it, you click and then feed her from your hand really close to the ground. Um, and then gradually work over to the bucket and, um, and also maybe don't make it like a really big, tall, like typical water bucket, like maybe like a feed pan. Um, those seem to work a little bit better for this just because they don't have to stick their face in it. Um, and that way you are slowly working towards it. So they're getting the idea that they're going to get fed in this location. And then you can start putting the feed in the bucket and then, you know, pointing to it or whatever, giving them a chance to see it and find it and then do that a couple times. And then the horse starts to learn, oh, okay, I'm getting fed out of the bucket now. So target, bucket, target, bucket. And then you can gradually move, you know, where you're targeting their head to, you know, a little bit of a distance away um, or change behaviors and then use the bucket. But you can't just expect <laughs> that, um, you know, if you're, if you're wearing a bum bag full of food, and then you click and the horse has this whole history of you hand feeding them when you click and then you throw some food in the bucket, they might be a little bit confused. Like, wait, you're supposed to give it to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, just make sure you take the time to explain it to them. Um, but yeah, okay. That is enough on that question. We have so many more and we're already at 40 minutes. So question number three, patron Libby asks about intelligent disobedience. I've been listening to the psychology in Seattle podcast personal fave of mine. And a while ago, I came across the episode on intelligent disobedience. When I first heard this term, I immediately thought about how it could be taught to young riders so they could feel comfortable saying no when asked to do something that would maybe feel dangerous to them, such as jumping too high or unethical, such as ripping a horse's face or smacking them. This <laughs> fits too well with the first question. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on young riders and intelligent disobedience um, and if the difficulties of getting trainers to respond more openly to intelligent disobedience in these cases. The next thing I thought of is how it could work for horses. Of course, we see horses with learned helplessness couldn't express any intelligent disobedience, but um, for horses in, say, a positive reinforcement environment, could there be a way to reward horses for expressing intelligent disobedience in hope of preventing them from continuing their training for the reward despite something being wrong? Um, so, um, I, I'll talk about the riders first. Um, yeah, I completely agree. If you don't know what intelligent disobedience is, the very layman version is pretty much what it sounds like. You're wisely being disobedient. So it would be like if somebody told you to jump off a bridge, um, you would be like, mm, no. <laughs> and they would be like, okay, you must obey me. And you'd be like, I would die. So no, I'm going to disobey you. Um, obviously, that's <laughs> a very juvenile example, but um, you can listen to the episode. I um, I had trouble finding it, but I think it's just on their website, but, um, they have their whole directory on there. Um, psychology in Seattle with Dr. Kirk Honda. It's, it's a fantastic podcast. If you're at all interested in psychology and why we do the things we do, I highly recommend it. But, um, yeah, so I think, um, I think it's definitely something that, um, should be more, uh, prominent. I keep saying, uh, I'm sorry, in the equestrian world, because <sighs> Like, like we said in the first um, question, that is a common thing, you know, where you're like, okay, I have this theory that this horse is acting this way and I don't want to hit them, um, you know, because I think they're acting out of pain and people are like, no, you just need to train them the way that you're supposed to. Um, so, you know, if the horse has ulcers, the, it would be more intelligent to treat the horse for ulcers rather than keep reprimanding it for acting um, like it's in pain. So... Yeah, I think it could absolutely be beneficial. Will it happen right now? 
Probably not. Um, I think that there is a lot of ego in horse training <laughs> for whatever reason. It seems like, um, you know, there are a lot of trainers out there that are incredible, but there are also a lot that are really my way or the highway oriented. And if you go against them, it is seen as disrespect. And, um, you know, I, I don't just disrespect. <laughs> um, so I think that um, it should absolutely be something that we use and something that becomes more accepted because I, I definitely know firsthand how difficult it was as a young writer who had ideas and some thoughts. And then when I brought it to uh, my trainer's attention, it was immediately shot down. Um, <laughs> like I just, I remember one of the biggest examples um, and I guess last ones, last incidents were, um, and you know, we're good now and I, I love her as a person, but um, you know, I just, I wouldn't train with her anymore, um, you know, because of this. And also I just don't ride traditionally. So there's really no reason to train <laughs> traditionally. Um, but so I essentially, it was when I first started learning about positive reinforcement and I w really wanted her opinion on it because I love and respected her and she'd been my trainer for years. And I was like, Hey, so I found this really cool new method of training where you use treats. And when the horse does something right you give them food and you mark it with a click and you know the people in the dog world do it all the time and it's it's working with horses and I think it's really cool and it could work for Zoe because she's so anxious whereas you know you know when you use negative reinforcement you the reinforcer is that you're relieving the pressure and um I feel like if I didn't have to do the pressure in the first place other than tactile cues but I wasn't that advanced yet um <laughs> but if I didn't have to use the pressure in the first place I could really reduce Zoe's anxiety and she was like like, it is positive reinforcement to release the rain pressure. And I was like, it's not, though. Um, I was like, it's the release of pressure. It is the removal of an aversive. And she was like, no, it's a reward. And I was like, I, huh? And she was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I'm glad that you, you know, are looking into training, but you, you're wrong. And, um, it is positive reinforcement. And, uh, you know, to kind of just explained the people that she knows and her reasoning and furthering why I was wrong and immature and ignorant. And, um, it was like just a huge slap in the face to me, honestly, because I was really excited about it and just really genuinely wanted her input and not an ego battle. Um, you know, and like I said, we're good now. Um, so if you, if you know my old trainer, um, there's no need to, I mean, if you would like to tell her, okay, <laughs> but I, I love her dearly. And I think she is, she's, you know, an awesome trainer, but doesn't have that understanding that most people actually don't have. That's why I have this entire podcast. Most people don't know how to train with positive reinforcement because it's not common in the horse world. And we're taught that, releasing pressure is a reward. Everyone always says, my whole life growing up, reward the horse for doing the right thing by releasing the pressure. It's not a reward. It is reinforcement, but it is not rewarding. Like I've said in past before, you know, think about it this way. If your boss says, okay, I need you to finish up your work today or else you're fired versus when your boss says, hey, if you finish up your work today, you're going to get um, a raise. So obviously it's a little bit, one's a threat and one's bribery, which are very, you know, not nuanced <laughs> forms of positive and negative reinforcement. But it's clear which one you would prefer. Um, and keeping your job is not a reward. It is a relief. Um, it's an avoidance of a threat. So you know, I mean, it, it's, it's just that lack of understanding. So I definitely, I I've been there and I know how hard it is to talk to trainers. And, um, you know, I just stopped training with her altogether. I stopped having a trainer period because of that. And I was just like, you know what, I, it's time for me to go on my own journey and explore this myself. Um, and so I think if I had, um, been allowed to, you know, if like, if, oh, kitty, just knocked your noggin on the desk <laughs> trying to jump into my lap. Ow. Um, but if, if intelligent disobedience was accepted more so in training, and I'm sure it's like this in other, you know, sports and um, coaching situations that it's not really um, cool for the student to question the master. But, um, you know, if it had been more acceptable, our relationship in a training sense probably would have been more preserved. I would have probably kept riding and we would have started learning more and incorporating um, some concepts based on 
the scientific evidence that's out there um, rather than me just being like, mm, I'm just going to woe back on traditional training and really focus on this for now. Um, so, yeah. And I mean, like you said, the difficulty is of getting trainers to respond more openly to intelligent disobedience. I really think it just comes from education. I think um, for me, especially, I used to think I knew <laughs> everything about training. I was like, I've got this, you know, I know how to ride a horse. I can ride anything, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in being wrong so many times and having more evidence thrust in front of my face that proved me wrong, um, I have, you know, become a lot more open to accepting that I might be wrong. Um, <laughs> because I just, I keep being wrong so often. It's kind of hard to just, you know, ride on the fact that everyone else around me doesn't know what they're talking about <laughs> because I've been wrong. So, um, I think it's just experience and, um, being humbled. And I don't think you necessarily have to be proven wrong in order to be more open to, um, disagreement or intelligent disobedience. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it'll come as the new generation comes up. Cause I think more and more people are starting to pay attention to science and are starting to actually look into why we train the way we do. Um, and if they would like to train another way. And I think that that is going to start a snowball effect in, you know, the next decades of um, where it's it's more accepted. But I mean, like I said, in probably any sport you deal with this where um, questioning the master is not really cool. Um, so, yeah, on to the aspect of a horse expressing it. I think it might be and I, I honestly I don't know, but. I don't know that horses would have a concept of necessarily intelligent disobedience, though their actions might be intelligent disobedience, if that makes sense. Like, I don't think if you asked a horse to walk off a cliff and it said no, that it would be logically like, you know, I know that you really want me to do this, but I am um, I'm going to politely decline because... <laughs> I don't want to die. I think it would just be more like, no, cliff equals death, you know? So it's, it's simplified, but I think you could definitely apply the concept and maybe that goes for humans too. I don't know. Most humans probably don't know what intelligent disobedience is. <laughs> um, sorry, I had to throw away a paper towel because my kitten was attacking it. It's just kidding, kidding, kidding. Um, yeah. So, um, as far as rewarding it and kind of training it, I think that might get a little bit complicated because I prefer to see training and kind of, because I'm a very literal person and it's really hard for me to, um, kind of be abstract. And it has been frustrating my art teachers as long as I've been alive. <laughs> um, but I think you just don't know what you're reinforcing is what I, I guess I'm getting at is that, you know, if your horse is saying no, like, okay, take a mounting block situation. So maybe the horse is dealing with some back pain and you lead them up to the mounting block and they normally line up and they step away. I, oh God, ow, cat just used my foot as a springboard and I'm trying to be ethical and not remove claws and that hurts so bad. Um, didn't see him coming. Um, anyway, sorry, cats are just being very distracting this episode. Um, but you line up to a mounting block and your horse, um, steps away you you're not going to know that he's stepping away because he's saying no I'm in pain um and also you've worked really hard to get a behavior where they line up to the mounting block Wally I told you oh, what is with my cats today I don't understand what is going on um being so annoying um but yeah so you're not going to know if the horse is in pain or not. Obviously, if my horse knows to line up to the mounting block and does it consistently pretty much every time, then if they're not lining up, I'm going to think something is wrong, but I wouldn't necessarily click for that. I might just feed them treats while I think about what's going on, um, you know, just for standing or whatever, um, you know, or to be reassuring, but I wouldn't necessarily click and mark that behavior as something that I'm shaping, um, per se. I don't know. There's some nuance to that. And I guess every trainer is differently. And I would like to hear some other opinions on that, but I really think that I would probably just be, um, yeah, I mean, you said, uh, reward horses for intelligent disobedience in hopes of preventing them from continuing their training for reward despite something being wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think I would like to think that horses that are trained with positive reinforcement feel that choice 
available to them. Um, you know, Zoe, she loves the training, but she also knows that I'm going to listen to her. So if she doesn't do something that I'm asking it, my first thought is not, oh my God, why is she being so obstinate today? It's what's, what's going on? Am I asking something wrong? Is she uncomfortable? Is she in pain? Is she unable? Does she not understand? You know, instead of, oh, she's just being obstinate. Um, and you know, I think that's kind of your point, but, um, to reward that specifically, I mean, you just don't know what you're rewarding. I think it's more of an indication of, okay, we need to think about this a little harder. And obviously I wouldn't punish them by just not feeding, but maybe, um, you know, just quit with what you're doing for that day. In the mounting block situation, I would just be like, okay, I hear you. Um, you know, be sure you're asking correctly. You know, if you line up at the mounting block and everything is the same as it always is, maybe you try again. If the horse still doesn't line up, then, you know, you know, for sure. And you've asked correctly in a way that made sense to them. Um, and that, I'm not saying that you need to like keep harassing the horse until it does what you want it to do, but just make sure that, you know, what you think is happening is happening. And then, um, just be like, okay, well, let's not do this today then. And, um, you know, I'll give you a break and maybe we can investigate what's going on. Uh, maybe you've got some back pain or something. You know, I think that that would be more the course of action that I take rather than trying to mark for intelligent disobedience, if that makes sense. There, I know that's kind of like a fine nuance line, but um, that's my answer. So number four from patron Kira. Uh, regarding lesson anxiety. So this question, when I read it, I thought it was really interesting. Um, so I hope you guys get something out of it. Um, I bought my mare five years ago as a rising six-year-old to bring along in dressage, and she's always been very honest and clever and always tries to do what I'm asking. She's also always been fairly obvious when she's upset about something or there's something that she doesn't like, and I think she dislikes lessons. I've noticed a consistent pattern that when I walk into the arena on days that I have lessons, she is... Sl- Uh, of a slightly different demeanor. It's not super obvious, just that she walks closer to me and her eyes look more anxious. Not sure how to describe it, but it's more like her eyelid is wrinkled, almost as if she is holding them more open, like she's alarmed or wary. Her mouth is also tighter and um, as in her lower lip is not as floppy or loose. It's always present when she knows she's walking into a lesson. She never does this when I school her on my own, regardless of environment. So I want to stop for a second and kind of talk about the behaviors you described. So that is perfect. So obviously you're painting Wally. Oh my goodness. Do you need to be in my lap right now? He says, yes, I need attention. Thanks. Um, (laughs) Okay. Maybe we have silent kitties now that aren't eating everything I own, like my boom mic, small one today. (laughs) Um, So the behaviors you describe are, you're right. Um, If you have done any looking into equine body language, um, you're you're dead on. Um, A wrinkled eyelid, um, they usually call that a triangle eye, where they're eyelid is like like if you imagine like raising your eyebrows and trying to pull them together that worried expression that's the horses do that too and um it could be alarm or nervousness or um you know just anxiety but um oh my goodness the cats today um (laughs) so you're dead on and having a tight lip and alarmed expression is definitely um indicative of anxiety. So you're right. Um, and if you guys don't really know how to recognize, um, facial expressions or body language in horses, I highly recommend reading language signs and calming signals of horses by Raquel Dreisma. It's available on Amazon. I think there's a paperback version that's a little bit cheaper now. I could be wrong. Um, but I have a link to it on my website, which is jetequitheory.com, and you can go to the positive reinforcement tab and find plus our books. I'm constantly updating my website. I'm trying to get, um, it to a point where my website is um, somewhat of a resource hub where um, I link you guys to all of the information that I have been privy to um, so that you know where to start as well as where to further develop your education. It's a work in progress right now. My site is live, but it's a lot of pages I haven't put anything on yet. They're just there. Um, So there might be a day that you click on it and it's like half written because I'm working on it. but yeah, so just just know that and um, check that out if it's something that you're interested in. I think that um, 
you know, just like if you were working with human children, you probably need to know what their facial expressions mean. Um, Working with horses is the same way. If you don't know what their facial expressions mean, you're going to be having a really difficult time in understanding what's going on and what they're trying to tell you. And then that might result in you having a horse that has to scream at you (laughs) and bite or kick or buck or, you know, get loud with you so that... um, they get their point across. So I would highly recommend looking into that. But yeah, so I'm going to continue reading the rest of her question here, which is, I've started speculating at whether it's because we ride for longer in lessons that are 45 minutes. Normally when I ride um, just schooling, we work for like 25 minutes max, including extensive walking before, during, and after the more concentrated work. I also consider it's maybe harder during lessons uh, as In schooling, I just brush over the more difficult material, whereas in lessons, we tend to focus on that difficult material for longer. Not to the point it's being drilled, but just more playing around with harder work for a minute. Or it's more than just playing around hard work for a minute. Um, I'm not sure what to do if she's good, playful, expressive, and curious, so I don't want to see her become anxious and unhappy. At the same time, I don't want to upset my trainer because she thinks I should bring my horse up to pre-St. George or so, um, which is awesome, by the way. Um... And I don't know how I would tell my trainer, hi, my horse doesn't like your lessons. My trainer is really great and has been letting us take time to develop properly instead of shortcuts to rush up the levels, but I'm confused. So maybe just your thoughts on my horse's behavior and or situation. So what I would say about this is that it it really depends. So I think that maybe you could talk to your trainer about um, trying out some shorter lessons first, you know, instead of working on 45 minutes, maybe shorten them. Um, but it it could be for a number of reasons that you're seeing the horse. It could be the duration. It could be the intensity. Um, it could be being uncomfortable with having somebody in the arena, like on the ground or in a chair or wherever your trainer is during your lessons. Um, or it could be, um, you have a little bit more anxiety or a different energy about you. Um, Sometimes we don't realize how our body language changes. And maybe when you ride, you're a lot more relaxed um, when you're schooling, I mean. And when you're in a lesson, you know, you're a bit, sit a bit taller, you have a bit different attitude, perhaps. And maybe your horse senses that um, through your behavior and, you know, kind of the attitude you put off. And And I'm not saying that when you go into lessons, you're arrogant, but I I also had this problem where I I rode differently in lessons versus by myself, Um, just because we ride differently when we're being watched versus when it's just us. So that could be it. But I would have a conversation with your trainer about this. I would sit her down and be like, okay, so... I have noticed something weird and I have been thinking this for a while and I've been trying to come up with a reason as to why it's happening and I can't really seem to pinpoint it and I'm wondering if you would be willing to play around a little bit and see if we can't, um, you know, solve this together. Um, Again, bring them into it. Don't be like, hi, your lesson's you know, stress my horse out. (laughs) Um, But be more tactful about it. And um, also consider it to the trainer. Um, And just being like, okay, I've noticed that my horse seems really stressed out in lessons. And I've been noticing this for a while, but I was trying to figure it out. And that's why I didn't bring it up to you. And also, I don't want to offend you or make you feel like, you know, my horse doesn't like you or anything like that. But I just I'm not sure what is changing. So I'm wondering if we could, you know, kind of brainstorm or think about this together um, and see if we can't find a way to make her more relaxed in lessons. And then, um, you know, if the trainer's like, okay, cool, what's, what's going on? Let's talk about it. Then you could be like, you know, tell me, tell her everything you told me about how you've noticed a change in her facial expression and her, uh, tension level versus when you ride alone. And, um, you know, maybe see if you can make them the same. And if that means, you know, maybe trying out having a person in the arena, you know, maybe a friend or your mom or your dad or significant other, um, you know, just another person, uh, maybe a fellow rider, just be like, could you stand in the arena? I mean, you can just play on your phone, (laughs) but can you just like be in the arena like the trainer would, uh, while I ride, you don't have to say anything to me. I just need to, um, you know, kind of do some variable isolation here. Um, you know, test that out first, maybe. And then you could, um, and maybe you do that before you talk to your trainer and just be like, okay, so I tried this. It doesn't seem to be that, or it does seem to be that, um, you know, wherever the situation takes you, then, um, try and work through some more variables and see if it's the duration that's causing the problem. Maybe, 
um, in your private rides, you could try flatting for longer, or you could try, um, you know, uh, my, my suggestion would be to, rather than up the intensity of the rides that seem to be proving successful, I would, um, you know, try and change up the lessons a little bit. And I know that can be really difficult to do for a trainer, but, um, I think if I'm not totally wrong here, I know it was some, um, pre-St. George Grand Prix level dressage rider. I'm pretty sure it was Edward Gall and Totalus, um, or Totalus or however the hell you pronounce it. <laughs> the ones that won the WEG a while back, even though they got into some scandal, um, in recent years. Uh, apparently he, um, said that he never really rode for more than 20 minutes on Totalus because the horse didn't need it. He was like, he comes out, he does his job, and then he goes away. Why would I make him work longer than necessary? There's no point in drilling it, like you said. Um, So maybe that's something that would work better for your horse. Just being like, I've noticed that she seems to do better in the shorter rides, so maybe we could do that. But I also don't want to, um, you know, make those short rides just like 25 minutes of hell, um, (laughs) you know, because if you shorten the rides, you know, your trainer might feel pressured to um, increase the amount of what you do in that amount of time. And maybe you bring that up to her and be like, okay, so I want to try having shorter rides, but I also don't want to try and jam everything in. I know our focus is uh, slow and steady wins the race and bringing my horse up properly. And I've noticed this is, you know, the condition that she does best in or seems to. So maybe we, um, you know, just slow it down even more and we work up even more gradually. And so when we're in those 25 minute lessons, we don't have to like do a ton of things. We can kind of, you know, just play around and focus and, um, essentially just do what you do in the flat. And maybe it's even 30 or 35 minutes, maybe just shaving off 10 minutes would work. Um, but yeah, I would just seriously have a conversation with your trainer and you know, throw out some suggestions, you know, like I've said, you know, saying I could try having somebody stand in the arena and see if that's the issue. We could try shortening it or maybe we keep it longer, but take more breaks and, um, you know, really pay attention to where my horse is at. Um, you know, just throw out some suggestions and ask her for her suggestions and work together to come up with what you think a good plan is, you know, plan A, plan B, um, and see if you can't get your horse to be more comfortable. Um, so yeah, I think you're absolutely on the right track. I think you're assessing it accurately if your horse is behaving the way you say. Um, it's very cut and dry. I mean, if your horse's eyelids are wrinkled and she's holding her eyes open and her mouth is really tight and um, you never see that outside of a lesson, then you're probably on to something. And mad props to you for paying attention uh, to that because a lot of people would not pay attention to that. So good on you. Um, but yeah, I hope that that is helpful. So moving right along, lightning speed to question number five from patron Olivia regarding aggression. Uh, So she says, I have a yearling who is starting to bite people. She hangs her head out of her stall for treats, and when they pat her, she just pins her ears and bites at them. Out in the pasture, she runs up to people for treats, and when they don't have them, she pins her ears and bites. I've grabbed her nose and told her no and made her back away when I've caught it, but people are afraid of her or call her a bitchy mare now, just like her mom used to be. Her mom was, but then again, she was pregnant, nursing, super young, hormones man. I don't agree anymore with it's just her attitude. Um... She doesn't get handled much by anyone but myself, but when she was a baby, we would have to pin her against the wall for shots and shoving medicine down her throat. I begun a little positive reinforcement with the little knowledge I have, but I, I just don't know why she would just attack people. They walk by her stall and she pins her ears and wants to bite them. No one has aggressively had to touch her since her first month of life. I'm just at a loss of what to think or do. End of email. So, um... I think to me, and maybe it's just a a matter of being caught up in the situation. And sometimes when you're so lost in the thick of it, it's really hard to see the obvious answers. But when you zoom out and from an outside perspective, I am inherently zoomed out. It seems fairly obvious the reason she would be aggressive. I mean, I would think that it's probably because in the first year of her life, you had to pin her against a wall and shove medicine down her throat and therefore handling was fairly aggressive. Um, and you know, don't like, don't get me wrong. 
especially with babies and if they get sick and you haven't had time to train them, you have to do what you have to do to keep them alive and, um, you know, help them survive. Like some of our babies that, um, you know, like Azula, for instance, when we first got her, she had never been touched before. And I had to deworm her five days in a row because she, like, she was still holding on to all of her baby hair and she was five months old. She was probably very wormy and likely not going to make it much longer if we didn't do something. And so I felt it was in her best interest to worm her rather against her will at the beginning rather than wait it out until I could train her um, to accept the wormer from having never been touched before, which is a long way to go. (laughs) So I was like, okay, this is what we're going to have to do. And I did it kindly, I will add, but it took a while. I mean, it, it took me working up to touching her and then, um, being able to put the wormer in her mouth and then her accepting it. And then it was like every day I had to start over because she was anticipating the wormer and didn't want it in her mouth because it was yucky or whatever. So, um, it, it it can be difficult. And sometimes you just have to do what you have to do to help the horse out because it's in their best interest. Ideally, you train it before, but like in the case of Azula, we didn't have her before five months. So there, I couldn't have trained her and I didn't even know she existed. So, um, it is difficult. Um, and I'm not shaming you for having done that, but I think it's a pretty logical explanation for why she is the way she is. Um, you know, just anticipating or expecting, you know, a history that, uh, she has, and she has no reason to not. So, um, I would say, uh, it's interesting that it's a, a filly though. Typically it's the, the colts that are more nippy, like Azula hardly ever bites. Um, but Astro and Dexter, quite nippy, but Sterling, our little Appaloosa guy, he doesn't really bite that much. Um, comparatively, he's about like Azula is, um, But yeah, so anyway, uh, also other things that could be contributing to it are, like you said, I've grabbed her nose and told her no and made her back away when I caught it. Um, obviously that's a very traditional mindset and that's, that's all we're often ever offered as a solution. So, um, you know, she's, she's now got not only when she was a baby, you had to do some things that maybe, um, were scary for her and aggressive and maybe made her a little bit fearful, um, to no fault of your own. But then also you, um, punished her in a traditional way. That was the only way you knew. So now she has been pinned against a wall, um, and given shots and then had medicine shoved down her throat. She has had her nose grabbed and, uh, told her no, whatever, that means I don't know if there was an action with that or just a verbal no, um, and then made her back up. So she is communicating with people. She is pinning her ears and biting at people, and then she's being punished. So she has no reason to be, you know, happy-go-lucky, comfortable, and polite around people. (laughs) Um, She has a lot of reasons to have some aggression. And like you said, her mom used to be aggression, aggressive, with hormones, and I I don't know that hormones necessarily contribute too much to aggressive behavior in horses, but um, I I don't really have any evidence to back that up, but I haven't noticed any of our mares really increase in aggression. I I do know we have one mare, Pia, um, when she has a baby, she's very protective, but it doesn't, like, make her, it's not that she's, like, frustrated, she's just Uh, But I think it it speaks more to her history with people than, um, you know, she's being protective um, because if she trusted people, then she wouldn't feel the need to be protective, if that makes sense. So I don't think it's, you know, an issue within the horse as so much as an issue with history and trust. Um, So, yeah, so I, I would recommend, obviously, you have to keep yourself and other people around her safe. So do what you have to do in the moments where things are, uh, you know, undesirable. But as far as training goes, I would say to refrain from grabbing her or hitting her or punishing in any way like that. Like I said, keep yourself safe first and foremost, but I would refrain from corporal punishment or hitting her. Um, And because if you are reprimanding her for expressing anger, you're either going to 
you know, increase her fear or increase her anger. And those are two things we don't want to do. So that's why I typically advocate against punishment and except for in cases where, you know, somebody's going to get hurt and the only way to prevent that is to be aggressive and get the horse out of your space or whatever. Um, so what I would say is find out why she is running up to people and then trying to bite them. It sounds to me, and I would have to see this firsthand to know for sure, but you're applying a reason to her behavior um, instead of saying, you know, there are possibilities. So you say she hangs her head out of the stall for treats, and when people just pet her, she pins her ears and bites at them. So you're saying that the reason that she's doing it is because she wants treats, and when she just gets pets, she bites people. So you don't know for sure that the reason she's hanging her head out of her stall is for treats. So there are other possible explanations, like maybe she wants to see what's going on and the people walk up to her and go to touch her and she thinks that they are going to, you know, be aggressive because of her history. Even if you don't really do that anymore, there's still a history and um, it doesn't sound like, you know, you've really worked on creating a positive association with your hands and like lifting your arm up near her. Um, so maybe, like I said, she's just looking out of her stall. And when people walk up to her and come into her space, she's like, Hey, get out of my space. I don't want you to hit me, you know, or I've just associated hands equal bad. Um, because we had a horse like this. I was just talking about Mac, my RRP horse. He was like this, you know, you would just walk up to him and his head would be hanging out of his stall. His ears are perked and he's looking at you and he's so damn cute. You just want to squish his face. But when you would walk up to him, he'd bite at you. He wouldn't pin his ears. Even his eyes wouldn't change. He would just bite at you. It was very rare that he would pin his ears. It wasn't so much as like, hey, I'm going to kill you. It was more of a warning. And, um, you know, I've seen the same behavior in horses that do pin their ears and do make aggressive faces, but it's usually that they've had more of a history. And also Mac seemed to be more shut down at the beginning. Um, little kitten, you're eating all of my cords. Stop it. She said, I'm going to bite you. Bite you. You are just like the horses that people are asking about. Vicious. Um, anyway, so it sounds like you're on the right track that you're like, okay, this isn't working. What else? So I really encourage you to, you know, like I said, stop punishing her. And I know that sounds really scary, especially when you come from a traditional world, um, or you were raised with punishment yourself. I was, um, and you're like, okay, but how do I stop the bad behavior then? Um, actually, you know, punishment, all it does is say that that's wrong. It doesn't give the horse any alternative. So if she's communicating, hey, get out of my space, and people keep getting into her space, all she can do is say, get out of my space, more and more aggressively. So if you give her an alternative behavior or teach her, you know, to like the things that she currently has bad associations with, then you fix the behavior inadvertently. You don't have to punish. And that's the whole point of training. That Training is to create an animal that is successful and well-adapted to our world and does the things that we prefer. To a horse, you know, what she prefers is saying, get the hell away from me, you know? And so instead of labeling it as her attitude or saying that she needs discipline, um, clearly that doesn't work uh, in this horse. You know, you've punished her and backed her and, you know, grabbed her nose and it's not changing, and now she's just still aggressive. So I mad props for looking for an alternative explanation, and I think you're on the right track. I just think that you probably need to focus on, um, A, creating good associations with the parts of your body that she is aggressive toward, and maybe that's just your presence. You know, I mean, like with Mac, I had to just reward him for letting me be near him, and that started with me standing outside a stall and standing outside his pasture and just working on being near him. And, you know, I focused on targeting because that was something he could do um, that didn't require really being near my person. And also he could, um, you know, he could do that and do a positive, fun, enriching brain puzzle activity with me near him. So it was all good things all in one. And then also it's very simple. So it wasn't, uh, had a low potential for frustration. 
and then I started working on teaching him to target his mouth to my hand. I have uh, a video up on my YouTube. I think it's called Solving Biting with Positive Reinforcement or something. Um, it's like a blue background with me and Mac in the picture. Uh, it says Solving Biting on it. It's from a while back. Um, but essentially what I did was just, um, you know, work on him not biting his halter first. And then I worked toward having him target his nose to my hand. Because if your hand is flat, they can't really bite you. Obviously, they could like get the side or something. But um, it was in a, a low stress enough environment that that didn't really happen. So I would just put my hand up and I would say touch after, um, you know, establishing that cue with a target first and so then it was easy to transfer to my hand I would hold my hand up say touch and he would touch my hand and then I would click and treat just for any touch even if he was biting at the palm of my hand I would still click and treat and I know that sounds really counterintuitive but I would gradually up the criteria just like I was saying with the babies where um I would get the behavior, but they would be kind of doing other things that I didn't really like, like backing up or turning around to look at me. Um, just like that, with the biting, I would make sure I was safe. You know, I started not in the stall with him, so he couldn't advance on me. And, um, you know, that way I would not have to hit him. If it got dangerous, I could just step away rather than punishing him. So, you know, I would reward him for touching my hand in any capacity. And then gradually, like what kind of happened, it, it happened on accident, but I, I noticed it and used it. And that's, I think, a lot of what um, positive reinforcement and shaping does. Um, he would, sometimes what happens with horses when um, they get really good at something. So say I hold my hand up and he touches my hand and he's biting or chewing, um, you know, the treats that are in his mouth from the last reinforcement or whatever. Um if I would wait a beat and I really encourage you being a very experienced trainer if you start doing this because you have to have a really good intuition and eye for how long is too long and that develops over time and because you don't want to frustrate but sometimes if you wait a second then they're like mm, okay it's kind of like if you walk up to somebody's house and you knock on the door and they don't come and you're like okay, I'm knocking. And then you knock a little bit harder and a little bit louder. Sometimes they do that with their behaviors as well. So he would, um, you know, he'd be munching on his treats and he'd, I'd say touch and present my hand and he would touch it, um, touch my hand with his nose. And then I just wouldn't click and he would just kind of rest his nose in my hand and then he would stop chewing. And I, Hey, let go turd. <laughs> I would, um, I would wait and he would stop chewing to listen for the click and then I would click. Um, so then the criteria became you need to touch my hand, but your mouth needs to be closed and still. And that's how I taught him to not bite around my hands. And I also did what I suggested to um, one of the patrons earlier that I would not walk up to him and put my hand in his space. I would offer my hand and let him come to me so that it was more collaborative and more communicative. I was communicative. I was asking his permission. And I know from a traditional background, that sounds like a lot of woo woo bullshit. And um, you're like, ask the horse's permission. Okay, right. Um, but any other animal, you know, um, you know, like cats and dogs are really typically really receptive to touch but sometimes with horses especially horses that have been hit in the past it's not a bad idea to ask is this okay are you good with this uh, and also it's kind of like a a sign of respect from you and also um oh i forget the word kind of like an olive branch like a um peace signifier that like you're like I'm not going to come into your space to prove to you that I'm not going to hit you, if that makes sense. You can come into my space, but you also have to train that behavior and make it a good thing so that the horse would want to, blah, blah, blah. We talked about that earlier. But yeah, so I would say with um, this horse that that is something that you need to work on. Um, you know, could also be ulcers. That tends to contribute a lot to aggressive behavior. Um, also, sometimes being stalled contributes a lot to... Um, aggression and stereotypies. So, um, maybe consider having her outside. Um, also sometimes early and abrupt weanings can contribute to aggression. So you might have some things working against you. It all depends on the individual horse and, um, the circumstances. So I would recommend first fulfilling all of her while you're going to kill him. 
so aggressive. Um, I would recommend fulfilling all of her basic needs first, which is having access to forage constantly, water, shelter, and buddies. We often forget that that is a basic need of horses, but they have to be with buddies. At the very least, they need to be able to touch another horse through the stall. At the very least, in my opinion. And um, isolation is not good for anyone's mentality. Even if they can see a horse from across the aisle, you know, that's, that's better than not seeing any horses, but it's still not ideal. And if you have a horse that is uh, exhibiting some aggression, making sure that their life is meeting all of their needs first is a really good idea Um, because you know you want to eliminate all the possible variables that could be causing this so if she's frustrated at being in a stall and being alone then you know that could be contributing to the aggression and you could do all this work behaviorally and training wise and still not really see it go away um The other thing that I would suggest is making, um, you know, your hand a good thing. I would absolutely start in protected contact because you want to eliminate the, um, the need to reprimand or punish in order to protect yourself. So if you are not in proximity to where your horse could bite you, then, um, you know, you can just step away rather than worry about them advancing and then having to keep them off of you. So starting protected contact, create a new association with your hands. Don't put your hands into her space. Um, I would start with target training, rewarding for that, working up to your hands and um, rewarding for keeping a still mouth. But this all has to be done gradually. I can't remember how long it took me with Mac, but I think there are timestamps on the video so you can see, but it was probably a week to a few weeks that it took me to really get to a point where I was confident that he wasn't going to bite me anymore. But I also really had to instill in him that I was not going to hit him because the second you break that trust after all that hard work, I mean, it's really, really difficult to get that back. And, um, I would also really recommend having a conversation with the people that are in your barn frequently. You know, if you have, Hey guys, can you stop being so aggressive? Jeez, cats speaking about aggression. Um, stop everyone. Um, I'm sure you can hear them like in the background, strangling each other. Um, and then the little one keeps asking for it. Um, but anyway, I would talk to the people in your barn or the workers or the people that handle your horse and explain to them what you're doing and um, tell them if, if anybody else has to touch her, tell them what you're doing and give them some guidelines to follow. You know, be like, if you have to protect yourself, do so. But otherwise, please do not um, reprimand my horse or uh, hit her because I'm trying to teach her that she doesn't have a reason to fear my hands, so she stops biting. Um, and you know, that might also be another drop in the bucket of needing to keep her outside, maybe, um, because then people wouldn't really have to deal with her. Um, in most pasture setups or pasture board setups, they just get fed and you don't have to, um, lead them to and from anywhere. And the last thing that I would do would be to have a conversation with the people in your barn and around you that interact with your horse and let them know what you're doing and just explain. So I am working with my horse on not being aggressive towards people anymore. And while we're working on that, I would really appreciate it if as much as you possibly can to just kind of leave her alone for a while. Um, because I, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to protect themselves against her, uh, while I'm working on this so that we can just get rid of it altogether instead of having some setbacks because, you know, people have had to punish her, which is understandable and just justifiable, but, um, I, I just, I think it would really help us out and make it go a lot faster so that, um, we actually never have to do that. And she grows up in the way that I'd like her to, um, you know, just really explain to everybody that right now we just need to leave her be, and I'm going to work with her. And then gradually, as I feel more confident, I'm going to generalize to other people to where they can, you know, reach up and she'll touch them kindly and not bite so that she generalizes that it's not just me that is not going to hurt her, but everybody is not going to hit her. And she has no reason to be aggressive um, and that we're going to be nice to her and help her and make her feel good. And everything that we do creates positive associations rather than the scary negative ones like the shots and the medicine and, um, you know, being grabbed in the face and stuff like that. Um, oh my God, the cats. I've had to refilm this part four times now because they kept screaming and tackling each other. And now I've separated them and one is in my lap to stop. 
Oh my god, they're being so annoying today for no reason. Sorry. Um, but anyway, I hope that answers that question. On to number six. I'm running out of time here. I try to keep these under two hours because it seems I can't go any shorter these days, but we got three questions left. So patron Rebecca asks um, about a lazy horse. How would you recommend getting a lazy lesson horse to go forward and respond to your leg without escalating pressure through the use of whip spurs, kicking harder, etc.? My biggest feedback from trainers has always been more leg, but I don't want to be aggressive. So I answered a question like this a while back. I think somewhere in the title, it was like no positive reinforcement trainers around me or something like that. Um, But it was about a girl that had a similar issue. Um, Not so much the lazy horse, but that, um, you know, the trainers kept saying kick harder, kick harder. And she was like, I really just don't feel comfortable doing that. And I'm contemplating stopping riding. And I recommended that you just have a conversation with your trainer and be like, look, this is not something I am comfortable doing. I don't want to increase pressure. And I feel like, um, you know, that's just not something that I really feel comfortable with. Is there any way I could get on a horse that is more forward um, so that I don't have to do that? Now, obviously, some trainers are going to be like, "Mm, you just need to kick the horse, get over it, or we don't have another lesson horse that would work for that. Um, Or, you know, no. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I'm assuming it's not your horse cause you said lazy lesson horse. Um, but the other alternatives are, um, solving the reason that the horse doesn't want to go forward. And, you know, sometimes lesson horses are taught to be slow so that they're safer. Um, and they have been reprimanded in the past for accelerating. Um, so there could be that blocking them. There could also be, um, you know, some level of learned helplessness to where they are just like, they're a um, luster in life. I don't forget what I'm trying to say. Um, But they just, they kind of aren't really sparkly anymore. They don't really feel um, good. And in the training, they're just kind of like, okay, I just have to get through this hour and then I'm done. Um, That's one possibility. Another is that um, maybe they just don't feel good physically. Um, You know, sometimes lesson horses are arthritic. Um, Sometimes they have, you know, feet that maybe aren't the best. And um, because they're at the lesson horses, not the show horses or personal horses. Um, Other times, you know, they might have some back issues. They might be uncomfortable. There might be some level of ulcers. There could be any number of reasons that the horse isn't going forward. So I would venture to say, especially in the older ones, it's probably some sort of pain discomfort issue. Um, You know, around like 13, 14 is when you start seeing some arthritic changes in horses, typically, not everyone, but especially in horses that have been through a lot of use you'll start seeing it then or sometimes earlier, um, and back pain too. Um, and so, I mean, there are a lot of things you could do, but I would just, it's so hard because, you know, like we've talked about a few times in this episode, sometimes trainers are more resistant than we'd like. Um, but just be like, I really just don't feel comfortable kicking, um, excessively or using the whips or spurs. It's just, you know, I love riding and I love horses and I really don't want to have to do that. Is there any way we could problem solve and figure out another reason that this horse might be a little bit lazy and another solution to the issue? If not, um, you know, I I don't know that this is going to work out for me. And, you know, I wouldn't say or else I'm going to move barns, but I would say, I don't know if this is working out for me. And then you might have to explore some other options. And, you know, if your trainer is insistent that you must spur or kick or whip, and you are expressing that you're not comfortable with that. And I don't, I mean, it sounds from your message, like you aren't, I, I don't know. Um, But if you are not comfortable and you've expressed that and they say that you must, then it's probably not a situation you want to be in anyway. Um, You know, in the last question that I answered about that, um, the girl ended up writing me back and she was like, I talked to my trainer and we made so many changes and everything is going wonderfully. Thank you so much. And I was like, hell yeah, that's so exciting because I'm such a pessimist when it comes to people in the horse world. Typically, I'm like, oh God, trainers, they just have a tendency to be a little bit sticky about, um, you know, some changes or requests for change. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I said, I would probably just be like, I really do not want to be disrespectful in any regard, but I personally am not comfortable whipping, spurring, or 
kicking excessively. So is there any way we could brainstorm some other potential solutions to, um, you know, why the horse I'm riding is not forward enough? Or could I, you know, see about riding a different horse? Or do you have any other suggestions? I have some ideas, um, you know, maybe the horse is a little bit arthritic, maybe dealing with some back pain, maybe we should check for ulcers, um, you know, just to make sure he's really comfortable and then feels good about going forward. Um, because I just, I really feel like something's, something's up and I just, I don't want to have to, um, you know, keep kicking or whipping or causing any, any excessive pain. It's just really not in my comfort zone and I, I can't do it. And if, if I need to, then I, I don't think this is going to work out for me. And, um, you know, just express like I would re- I really want to do this. Um, I love horses and I want to ride, but you know, I, I also just, I know what's in my realm of ability and that is not in it. Um, you know, I mean, you can just be straightforward and be collaborative and open and, um, make some suggestions and also just explicitly state where you're at. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, so patron Caroline for question number seven here asks about blanket biting. Um, I'm going to try and get these next two questions done in, uh, these next 25 minutes. Hopefully I can do 25 minutes. We'll see. So her question, I'm going to read it in its entirety. Felix has recently started to bite his cover, which is, I believe the UK term for blankets, (laughs) um, or the, um, Oh God, east, like that direction. I know a lot of people on the Asia, Europe continent tend to uh, say cover instead of blanket. Anyway, uh, Felix has recently started to bite his cover when putting it on or taking it off. He'll put his head down low and try to bite it. A few times I've tried to let him bite it and shake it around a bit and stomp on it. Then he's generally okay with me putting it on him. The other person who helps blanket seems to think it's because I'm feeding him by hand via clicker training, but I don't think so. I always try to make sure to mark the end of a session by leaving a small pile of feet on the ground and give him some time alone to process. I think it might be because the cover was ill-fitting. It does seem a bit tight around his chest, but other than that, it's fine. He has also done it once the uh, with his other cover, so maybe it's a playfulness thing. Also, I've just had my farrier out, and she um, found that he had a bit of a thrush starting. I think he's had a bit of trauma in the past because he didn't like people touching his feet. My farrier who does do positive reinforcement is really good with him and picks up his feet. Okay. But I can't just yet. It's something I've just started working on with him relevant because he started nipping me because of how, um, or independent of the cover. When I am just hanging out with him, he'll start sniffing around me. So I put my hand out and he'll try to bite my hand, pushing down to be able to bite it. I'm not sure if I'm encouraging it by putting my hand out, but I'd rather he bite my hand (laughs) than my leg or something. Other times he'll yawn and then immediately nip at me, not touching him just near, or he can start sniffing around me. Then uh, go to bite when he thinks I'm not looking. I'm not sure if the thrush could be causing this or if it's another issue. I have a physio coming out to see him next week and he had his teeth done in May, so it shouldn't be that, though maybe it's worth a check. I'm not sure what he's trying to communicate, but I just wish his communication didn't end up hurting me. So yeah, a lot of components from everything else we've talked about, um, you know, in regard to biting. Um, but some thoughts that I have about this specific case is that Zoe also does this, actually. She hates being blanketed. And for her, it's because it shocks her. And, you know, when they've got their fuzzy winter coats and I put the blanket on, it really shocks her. And I'm sure there's some sort of like spray that I could put on the inside of it that wouldn't damage her skin and would also cut down on the static. But um, it really developed over the more recent years. And I just haven't had a chance to work on it, especially since last winter, I didn't really blanket her because it was I actually like let her coat grow out and let her be a horse instead of um, shaving her and then piling on a thousand blankets. Um, And I'm not saying that I'm against body clipping or anything like that, just that I that was the first time I just let her body do what it's designed to do. And so it kind of didn't really make the blanketing necessary, except for on the really, um, like when we were expecting rainy, super cold days, I'd put her rain sheet on just so she wouldn't be soaking wet. Um, but she typically stands in her shelter anyway when it's raining. So who knows? Um, but yeah, so I do have experience with this and it's not something that I've worked to fix, but I think it usually has to do with more than just the blanket. So obviously, Um, you know, some initial comments are that, um, you know, the horse is expressing frustration by biting and, um, shaking it or stomping on his blanket. Um, so that's, 
it's pretty clear that not a fan of the blanket. Um, and then you say he's generally okay with you putting it on him. Probably if I had to guess, because he knows no matter what he does, it's going on anyway. And I mean, you know, if, if you're a blanketer, then it isn't the welfare of your horse to put the blanket on. Um, again, generally, um, there have been some studies done that, um, show that sometimes blanketing can do more harm than good. So I, it's case by case and it depends on your area, but, um, you know, it depends on how the horse is adapted as well. But, you know, like in Canada, typically don't blanket until it is the equivalent of like, you know, 20 below, um, in Fahrenheit. (laughs) So, um, horses can withstand a lot more than we think. And just because you're cold doesn't mean that the horse is cold, but that is an entirely separate tangent that maybe I will touch on at a later date. But I would just look into some of the research on it and thermoregulation and that sort of thing. And if it's really necessary, not just what Smart Pack says on their little blanket guides on, because I mean, they're like, if it's 10 or if it's you know, 70 degrees outside, put a light sheet on. And I'm like, are you kidding? No, I wouldn't put a sheet on until it's below 40, (laughs) um, at least, you know? So I don't know. They're also trying to sell blankets. So keep that in mind. I would go with, um, some studies that are not selling a product or funded by a product brand. Um, but yeah, so that's initial thoughts. And then, um, I would say it's, the person that um, helps you blanket says it's because you're feeding him by hand. I disagree. That is actually usually the opposite of the case. If you clicker train properly, then the horse knows how to interact with um, hand feeding in a better way than most horses that aren't clicker trained. Um, especially if you do it correctly, then you train the horse how to respond around food and it's generally to stay out of your space and not bite. Um, so also you have an end of session cue, leaving a pile on the ground. It's great. Um, and also you said the blanket didn't fit him very well and it was tied around his chest, but other than that, it's fine. That might be enough for him to not like the blanket. So, um, it could be uncomfortable, um, that it's too tight, or maybe it's putting some pressure on his withers or pulling funny. Um, and you said he's done it once with his other cover. So maybe it's a playfulness thing. I, I doubt it's, it doesn't sound like play to me. Um, especially if it's every single time, it's probably not play. Um, but, uh, yeah, he might also, he might be sore somewhere. Um, Amber, Zoe's mom, I'm going to have our muscle therapist take a look at her. I noticed the other day, um, Zoe's favorite spot to be scratched is, um, her chest and under her neck. She loves to be scratched right there. And I went to do it to her mom too. Cause I was like, logically maybe that. And she almost bit the shit out of my arm. Like it was a warning shot for sure. If she had wanted to bite me, she would have. Um, and I was like, oh my God. So I was like, okay, for science, I'm going to gently touch your chest. And immediately her ears went flat. And I was like, okay, we're going to have the muscle therapist take a look at you lady. Cause you are sore. So, um, you know, sometimes they have some discomfort there. So maybe, um, maybe that's adding to it. So you also asked about thrush. And while I don't think that that is going to be causing um, the biting because thrush typically in my experience, I haven't really ever seen it like make a horse aggressive. It could contribute overall if, um, you know, usually thrush is a symptom and not a, um, cause. So typically, and I've been doing a lot of research on hooves and, um, it's kind of like my, um, focus from the, or on the horse right now. Um, you know, sometimes it's theory and training and other times it's body parts. And right now I'm really focusing on the feet and you cannot think about the feet without thinking about nutrition. And, um, typically the reason that we see thrush and white line disease and things like that is because, um, we have microorganisms in our environment that feed on dead or necrotic tissue. And so when you have, um, a horse that does not have, um, proper nutrients or has too much sugar, um, and not enough zinc or copper and too much iron is frequently the problem. Um, we don't have a balance. So if you have all of those components or some of them, then your horse does not have, you know, what it needs to make, um, good feet. So then you have 
dead, dying tissue inside their feet, um, which attracts the microorganisms which get in their feet and break it down. And then we put in, you know, thrush buster, which is basically iodine, which is caustic, which kills the bad bacteria, but it also can be damaging to the good bacteria. So then you have more dead tissue and then it just sort of rebounds and keeps repeating from my understanding. Um, It's a very basic understanding at this point, but um, makes sense to me. So the problem is not changing thrush buster um, or, you know, removing the horse from any sort of wet environment or keeping them in a stall or anything like that. The solution is their nutrition. Um, and that also plays a role in why the horse may be biting. Um, if he's got some problems going on with his feet and he's biting, um, I would, and, and you know, blanketing too, this could play a role in, um, sensitivity. When horses have ulcers, they, uh, tend to be really sensitive on their skin and they hate being blanketed as a result because it's literally all on their skin. So I would, uh, palpate for ulcers, read up a little bit on it. I said earlier, you can... Go on YouTube and look up how to palpate a horse for ulcers. You'll find DePaulo Equine Concepts. You can go to their website. They have a health library. And under the digestive issues uh, heading, there are two articles that are so worth the read. If you can just find the time, absolutely take a read and learn what you need to look for in your feed and how to prevent ulcers and how to treat them, how to test for them, all those good things. Um, and really get educated about it because it's a really, really prevalent issue. Um, Horses don't have to be bucking or trying to bite your head off when you girth them. Um, If, I mean, they can all present differently. It can also be a different location of ulcers, hindgut or foregut, um, you know. So I would um, would definitely think about things like that. Um, Treat for ulcers, change up his nutrition, make sure he's getting enough zinc and copper, um, make sure that you don't have any sugar or less than 3% sugar um, in his feed, and then you should see a huge change in um, their um, in their feet and the thrush as well. And you'll probably see a behavioral change, and then after that you can start creating positive associations with the blanket, but you have to rule out the pain issue first. It's just like undoing girthiness or anything like that. You cannot have a horse that's in pain um, like a girth. <laughs> it's it's just not going to work. You can't train it away. Um, you could maybe train the horse to hide it, but um, you don't want that either. So I would I would really say to take a look at that. Also, you mentioned the yawning or um, the biting like down and like pushing down in your hand to try and bite it. A lot of that sounds like anxiety to me. Um, you know, you say you're just standing near him. Um, I, I, I don't know. I would have to probably see it or be there. Um, but if you're at the $35 tier on Patreon, you could send me a video and I could tell you what's what I see. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I mean, you could also have the same problem with a horse. Um, if he's sensitive to touch and you put your hand out, um, and then you're seeing him bite your hand, it could be because he's anticipating that maybe you're going to touch him. And even if he hasn't been like hit in the past, like one of the previous horses, um, touch might not feel good. And he's like, get away. Or I've also seen some horses do that as sort of a nervous behavior to like kind of gnaw on the palm of your hand. Um, and then, uh, you know, yawning and then try and nipping you um and then you said he, or he's just sniffing around me and then go to bite when he thinks I'm not looking um that sounds a little bit anthropomorphic like I don't think your horse is waiting on you to stop looking at them and then attacking you um it's probably just you know happenstance also horses are a lot better at reading our body language than we are theirs so I would trust him and um you know I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I definitely have the physio out to look at them and then do some research and digging into, um, understanding ulcers and treating for that. And then, um, you know, cause if you can figure out why he doesn't like the blanket, um, you know, whether it doesn't fit him or his skin is sensitive, I would definitely invest in another one. If it's too tight around his chest, I would find another blanket or, you know, if you don't have to clip him or anything like that, then, you know, do a little bit more research on whether or not you should blanket. And, um, you know, obviously I would try to work through this so that you have a horse that is comfortable being blanketing should anything ever happen to you. Um, and then nobody else has to ever <laughs> hurt him in his life for not enjoying blankets. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always good to train for the just in cases, but, um, you know, if you don't have to use a blanket, then, you know, 
don't have to use a blanket. So our last and final question is from patron Andy. Number eight is perspectives on riding after switching to positive reinforcement. So when starting clicker training and positive reinforcement, is it normal to have a t hard time riding? I kind of feel like I don't know how to ride my horse anymore because I don't want to do anything negative to him. I'm not a harsh or demanding rider to begin with, but Reno um, does need pretty consistent bit contact to control his speed at the trot. Now I'm questioning whether or not he wants to even be ridden or worry that I'll undo our positive reinforcement work if I ride him. I used to ride him every day, but now people at my barn are asking why I'm not riding. So it makes me feel a little bit of pressure. Um, it's just strange. And I wonder if you have experienced this or what your thoughts are about the situation. Um, so that is the end of the question. And I, I definitely have felt this and I'm sure, um, you know, anybody else who's listening that has switched to positive reinforcement or started clicker training, um, in any capacity has been like, okay, so where is the line here? Um, and I've definitely experienced that quite a bit. And while yes, Zoe had some health and soundness issues there for a while, that wasn't really why I wasn't riding. I mean, obviously <laughs> it was a part of it, but, um, when she was sound, I still didn't really want to ride just because like, it didn't feel the same to me anymore. We had client horses, um, you know, my boss's sales horses that I, um, you know, had to ride. And I just realized that I kind of wasn't really enjoying it anymore. It just didn't have the same, feel or energy and didn't give me the, you know, the same emotions and, um, I don't know, sensation, whatever that it used to. And it just kind of felt like work and it also felt mean. And that's not to say that I think that riding traditionally or anything like that is inherently mean or bad or whatever. Um, but it just, it didn't give me the same, you know, positive, happy, euphoric feeling that it used to. And, it can be really hard to want to ride <laughs> when that feeling goes away. Cause I mean, why else would you ride if you're not really enjoying it? Um, and especially if you're worried about, you know, trying to reevaluate and assess like, Oh my God, what is negative? What hurts my horse? Am I forcing him? What is consent? Blah, blah, blah. Like all of those questions swirling through your mind kind of take away the fun <laughs> of riding. Um, so I don't think it's a bad idea at all to take some time and sort out how you think about it. That's what really helped me. I, my body kind of like forced me into it. <laughs> um, because I just found myself not riding. And then I realized that that's just what I needed. And sometimes my body gets ahead of my brain or my brain gets ahead of my consciousness and is like, okay, we're just going to do this and eventually she'll figure out, <laughs> you know, she'll get on the same page. And it really helped because instead of like trying to deal with all of that emotional turmoil and ride, um, and then also try to enjoy it, it's just like, it's, it's, it was too much for me and I could see how it would be too much for people in general. So I think taking a break and just kind of reevaluating and, you know, taking the time to educate yourself and see how you could ride in a way that felt right to you, whatever that means, whether that means only positive reinforcement, some positive reinforcement, some negative reinforcement, or all negative reinforcement, whatever feels most closely aligned with what you want to do is, um, you know, it's going to take some time to figure out what that is because A, you have to explore the options available to you in order to make the best decision. And B, you have to, you know, deeply think and reflect on what would feel good to you. Does it feel good to ride traditionally or does it feel good to ride all positive reinforcement or does it feel good to ride somewhere in the middle on that spectrum? Um, so it's, it's entirely personal and up to you. Um, but I also implore you to, you know, consider your horse in the situation, pay attention to your horse and his behaviors and, um, you know, see what your horse wants to do and what your horse enjoys. Um, cause this is not all about one person. It is about the partnership and both of you. And hopefully it's mutually enjoyable. Um, but yeah, so, and then you also talk about how you need to have pretty consistent bit contact to control the trot. And, um, I think a lot of that can be resolved on the ground. And if you have to tell people that you're going back to classical dressage routes to help with balance and build strength on the ground in order to fix some of your under saddle issues so that they, um, you know, get off your back about riding, um, that might be a way to approach it because that really can help if you, um, start teaching your horse how to use his hind end and slowly build strength on the ground. Then when you get on, then, um, you know, you have a lot more chance at having a horse that is not falling forward or running on the forehand. So, um, I just recently listened to a podcast. I think it's called straight from the horse doctor's mouth. It was called, 
pain in the spine, I think, problems in the spine, something like that. And um, it talked about kissing spine and arthritis and neck and uh, back issues in terms of the spine. And they just put so many things into perspective that even me, who has researched a lot about uh, back pain in horses, did not realize so many things that they just think about, you know, their back is, the horse's spine is on a, it's like a suspension bridge. And if there isn't the muscle and strength to hold it up correctly, then it starts to sag. And then if you add a rider, you know, it's pushed down even further. And that's where you can maybe get some rubbing or um, start showing signs of kissing spine. And they did say that um, they don't know whether it's genetic or if um, riders influence it. The, um, the veterinarian on that podcast said that she doesn't really think that riders influence it that much but um you know obviously I'm not a veterinarian but logically from my perspective and I know like sometimes vets they can't say things on you know public domains because there you know there's some licensure and stuff involved but from my perspective it makes sense that a horse that is already weak in the back you know whether they're confirmationally predisposed or not if they don't have a proper top line and really good core strength then adding a rider that is riding them incorrectly for long periods of time and exercising the wrong muscles and further um you know, kind of putting weight on that spine incorrectly without helping it. Um, I could definitely see how that would cause problems. So I think to like, I'm going off on a tangent here, but, um, I think that it's really important to consider the way that you're riding your horse. Um, because Zoe does have kissing spine and they said that the number one, um, you know, rehab protocol is developing core strength. And, typically in horses that are really on their forehand don't have core and haunch strength because, you know, 60% of their body weight is on their forehand and their center of balance. I think it was like four inches behind and six inches above where, um, you know, the point of their elbow. So like if you go back and then up just right at the front of their rib cage barrel area, you, um, that's their center of balance. So it's really far forward in relation to like where half of their body is. (laughs) So, um, you know, you have to think about that. And if you're experiencing problems with the horse running on the forehand, in my eyes, the solution is not to, you know, stop the horse up front by reprimanding his mouth, but to get his body successively um, up to a point where it can rock back on the hind end. Because you can't force a horse to sit back on his hind end um, and carry himself that way if he's not strong enough. I mean, imagine trying to do a squat for five minutes if you've never done a squat in your life. It's very hard, let alone when you're trying to, you know, have a hundred pound person on your back for 45 minutes. So, I mean, you really have to think about that. It's really no different for them versus us because, I mean, we could have 20% of our body weight in a um, backpack, you know, that's saddle, bridle, rider, all of the tack weighting them down. Um, And naturally, they probably wouldn't do it on their own for longer than 30 seconds to five minutes. So, I mean, it's, you rarely see horses going around in the field rocked back on their hind end. So if we're going to ask them to do that in training, we need to work up to it and help their bodies develop into it before we just go into asking them to be in an engaged frame. Because most horses are not confirmationally predisposed to be uphill and on their hind end. And even then that can present problems with hollowness. Um, But yeah, so I I would really encourage you to think about that and also screw them because (laughs) like, I mean, if people are hating on you for working on the ground, they don't understand classical work because most of that is done on the ground. Very little of it is done in the saddle because it's much harder to train those behaviors, you know, with that added weight. And if the horse is already strong enough, then adding the rider is just, you know, just a different circumstance. Um, You know, I think Alexander Kurland... Um, she, I I learned it from her, but I I feel like somebody else has probably said it before. Um, I think she quoted somebody else, but that dressage is, um, or riding is just groundwork sitting and groundwork is riding standing. So, I mean, (laughs) like it's, it's all the same. And in traditional equestrianism, you know, we, we, we don't do groundwork. We lunge and we call that groundwork. (laughs) That's not, It's not really groundwork. I mean, yes, you're on the ground, but your horse is going in a circle, usually to wear off some energy. It's, it's, that's not really, um, training. And also just putting the horse in side reins or in gadgets is also not particularly helpful due to 
you know, tension, confounding variables and things like that. It doesn't really develop the muscles that you want it to. It can, of course, but it is not really achieving the goal that we think it is most times. And um, it there there are other ways to do it that are more effective. Um, so, yes, I definitely think that groundwork should be... Um, be a real focus and we need to shift to that for sure but it's boring and nobody wants to do that it's much more fun to go jump four foot or you know work on lateral movements in the saddle rather than start from the ground and slowly work your way up with patience (laughs) especially in a world of instant gratification it's not the norm but um anyway to continue on about perspectives um You know, you're questioning if he even wants to be ridden or worry that riding will undo your positive reinforcement work. Um, There are endless ways that you can approach that. I mean, like I said, um, you can figure out what works best for you, what balance of negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement works for you. Or if you want to start completely over and try and retrain everything from positive reinforcement, you can do that too. I know Adele Shaw at the Willing Equine just had an episode on um, riding with positive reinforcement. She talked all about that. Um, And, you know, she comes from pretty much an exclusive positive reinforcement um, background and perspective. So um, if you want that one, that is there also. Um, I haven't quite figured out exactly where I lie. I know I lie somewhere in between um, exclusive positive reinforcement and positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So I I don't really ever like to ride with strict negative reinforcement personally, but um, I also don't like to ride, you know, with a perfectly even balance. I prefer more positive reinforcement than anything. Um, But that is me. And that is also my horse. Some other horses might tolerate a lot more negative reinforcement better than say Zoe. Um, But right now she's not being ridden because she's got kissing spine and we haven't done the rehab. But that also, I should say, I am going to work with um, Cara Musgrave. She is Musgrave Equestrian on Facebook. I think she has an Instagram as well. I need to double check that. But um, she has a website. um, But the easiest way to get to it is from her Facebook. And she is doing a course this fall. When I have more information, I'll talk to you guys more about it, but it's about helping horses with all of those things that I just talked about, ironically, um, you know, finding their balance, using their hind end and, um, proprioception and, um, rehab work. Uh, she did a lot of like neurological issues. And if you go to her website and then look at the course that she's doing, like she talks all about it. She has a video and stuff and it's super, super impressive. Like she had this horse that it just looked drunk. Like if you've ever seen a horse that has been, um, uh, oh god what is it called sedated <laughs> and then you try to lead them and they're kind of just like fall sideways and trip a little bit and they just look like they've had eight too many beers um that's how her horses were or one of her horses was at baseline because he was, had a neurological problem and she rehabbed him all the way I think she said to riding or something I I'm not you'll have to fact check me but I'm pretty sure he yeah he is under saddle yeah I, that is at the end of the video um so incredible amazing process and she does positive reinforcement on the ground lots of targeting and stuff like that and I am actually going to be participating in that course this fall so if you would like to join me um, definitely check that out and if you can't find it shoot me an email at equitheory at gmail.com and I will send you the link Um, but I'm really excited to do that because that'll kickstart Zoe's um, rehab for me because I've had a really hard time getting started because I get paralyzed by expectation of perfection. (laughs) Um, but anyway, that is on my to-do list and I think that would be really awesome. Um, but yeah, and maybe patron Andy, that's something that you want to, um, think about. I also know, um, on, I think it's the 12th of September. I could be wrong, but if you go to fair horsemanship on Facebook or Instagram, she posted about a, um, a a zoom meeting that she's doing about riding with positive reinforcement. I think it's on the 12th of September. Um, and I think she said it'll be available for a couple days after that, um, via recording if you can't make the zoom meeting. Um, but it's all about riding with exclusive positive reinforcement. I don't know. I can't speak to the quality of the lecture or like, you know, how in depth she'll go, but maybe that's something to look into. I will also be, um, attending that. I might not watch it live because I will be at a hoof clinic, but, um, I might, uh, or I'll definitely be watching it after I already bought it. So, um, there also on my website, I have, um, at jetequithery.com under the positive reinforcement tab, there are some online courses and some books that, um, talk about it. If you want to learn how to ride with positive reinforcement, um, 
But yeah, so I mean, and maybe you just have to figure it out and see if that's something that you want to work towards or if you want to do some incorporation of traditional and positive. Um, or I shouldn't say positive. I mean, like positive reinforcement, not good. <laughs> um, but um yeah, I really think it's personal, and it definitely changed my perspective on traditional riding. I, d I don't really like it, and especially since I have the association of having a horse that has a severe aversion to pressure and has a lot of anxiety, it, it's really tainted my perspective on it, and I don't know. I just, I find myself fighting a lot more with the horses when I ride traditionally, and I tend to get this, this concept or schema or something in my head that when I'm riding I feel like I'm just working against them and that's that doesn't go for everybody I've just I notice when I ride and the horse doesn't really cooperate I get frustrated a lot faster than I do when I'm training with just positive reinforcement and um, that could just be from my upbringing or some history that's lodged in there but whatever the case I just have a little bit of uh, difficulty um enjoying na riding neg with negative reinforcement traditionally geez keep trying to combine too many things um but yeah so I mean it's it's totally up to you and personal preference um and if it's not something you really find yourself enjoying anymore then you are more than you know invited to start exploring some other alternatives or possibilities for the way that you want to work with your horses and that is totally fine and if people are judging you you know I mean that's it can be really hard to deal with and demoralizing but just know that you know you're trying to do what's best for you and your horses and that just doesn't look the same for everybody and it's okay if you're doing something different and I mean you can express that to the people around you and just be like I know that you guys are concerned and you're used to people riding all the time and um you know you want to know why I'm <laughs> being weird but um you know it just riding normally doesn't feel right for us personally I I'm just not really enjoying it anymore and I am just trying to figure out you know the ways to playing around with different ways that, um, we could ride to make it more enjoyable for the both of us. And, you know, not saying anything about the way you ride or anything like that. Just, I'm not, I find myself not really enjoying it anymore, but I still love horses and I still want to ride, but I think it's just the way I'm going about it is not my favorite anymore. So I'm just exploring and, um, please don't judge me. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can make a joke about it lighten it a little bit but I think addressing it might help too because sometimes I think people especially when they are like judging you inadvertently or they're like why aren't you riding and you know things like that um they don't realize that you you know how much they're judging you or how um kind of rude and invasive that can be so if you're like you know I know that you guys are kind of looking at me like I'm being weird it's kind of like a little wake-up call like a hey I, I know, I know what you're thinking. Um, and you know, it's not like a call out or to be, you know, rude or confrontational or anything, but just sometimes people are like, oh yeah, it's, that, that makes sense actually. And I should probably not, <laughs> you know, act like that. Um, you know, just a little bit more self-awareness from others. Um, but yeah, I think that pretty much answers that question. And I, I mean, really, I mean, my, I did have a hard time riding when I changed. Um, and then I had to find out what riding looked like for me. And I think that's kind of a journey that everybody goes on when they um, start questioning training methods. You know, you have to figure out what you what you liked about what you did and what you don't like about what you did and find some things that you like better. So anyway, I have answered eight questions. It took me two hours and six minutes. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap this up and... Uh, to you guys next Tuesday. But if you want to check out anything that I suggested, I will eventually have every single link that I mentioned up on my uh, website on uh, jedequithery.com. And you can explore the site. I'm turning it into a resource hub. Like I said, it's going to have a ton of links and um, books, podcasts, blogs, articles to explore um, and increase your knowledge. And I'll always be updating it. So I'm working on that right now. And hopefully I'll have everything up. The only thing that I think that I mentioned that is not on there right now is the Tapalo Equine Concepts, but I should have it up in the next week or so. Um, but like I said, you can easily get there by um, going to YouTube and typing in horse ulcer palpate or how do I see if my horse has ulcers or something like that. And then he'll have a link to his website in the description or you can just type it in on Google after you look it up. Because I always have a hard time spelling Tapalo. It's confusing. <laughs> there are a bunch of uh, vowels <laughs> and I'm horrible at spelling. Um but it, uh, 
there, I highly recommend reading the articles that are on his site about ulcers. And then I plan on doing a podcast in the future about it um, so that when people have questions like that, I can direct them there and be like, okay, after you listen to this, now let's see if you still have questions. If not, then then we'll get to it. But um, yeah, so that's coming in the future. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, it's Jet Equitheory. And if you want to follow the podcast so you get updates about that, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Just equithery it's at equithery um which is e-q-u-i-t-h-e-o-r-y same way it's spelled here and uh also you can become a patron of the podcast and support us and get some cool benefits and beyond that i think that is about it and thank you guys so much for listening i will talk to you not see you talk to you next tuesday (laughs) 